Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today. And as uh, Flor just said, I work at the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. And I will be talking about uh, how we can make mobility more sustainable uh, through the action of business. Uh, just to start, I would like to give a short introduction uh, of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development for those who do not know it. Uh, so the WBCSD uh, is a CEO-led organization. Uh, so we represent over 200 businesses uh, who believe in the fact that we need to work together to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. Uh, so our vision is to create a world where more than 9 billion people are all living well and within the boundaries of our planet by 2050. Uh, to do so, uh, we use uh, both our vision and uh, a lot of uh, sustainability indicators that we are working on. Uh, and uh, we are a really a unique business platform uh, that is global. And uh, I have a small slide with uh, some of our members here. Uh, so you can see uh, we represent uh, really a lot of different uh, sectors. And that's also the force of the WBCSD is that uh, we bring together uh, people from across their supply chain to work together on sustainability goals. Uh, so how do we approach this question uh, is that we target the sustainable development goals through six work programs. Uh, so as Flor said, I work uh, in the mobilities program, uh, which is uh, a joint program with uh, cities, because we believe you cannot change mobility uh, without changing the cities. Uh, then we have a program on climate and energy, one on food and nature, uh, one who is around people. Uh, one about circular economy, and all of that uh, revolves around uh, what we call redefining value. So is to redefine how we work uh, on the topic of sustainability uh, and what is value, how do we uh, make capitalism work again. Uh, so the WPCSD uh, works with businesses to make uh, the world more sustainable. Uh, and it's often one question that arises is why should businesses work on making mobility more sustainable? Uh, and there's actually two, quest uh, two very straightforward answers for that. The first one is that we need joint action to have impact on transport offer and demand, uh, and businesses can actually impact both of them. Beyond that, uh, we also have the emissions from uh, from mobility that are very high. So 24% of the global emissions in 2019 uh, were transport related. And of that more than 50% is linked to people's movements and uh, to commuting. Uh, so that's something where the businesses really have an impact. Uh, beyond that, uh, there are problems linked to mobility that are uh, also problems for businesses. For example, congestion is one cause for air pollution, stress and anxiety in individuals, and that's bad for business. Uh, and beyond that, uh, we can have shifts in cost and space usage. Uh, so that's something that is interesting both for cities and for businesses, and one of the reasons why businesses should get engaged. Uh, so businesses have been looking into uh, how can we make mobility more sustainable uh, for different reasons. So. Uh, there is the first reason, which is that businesses, cities, and countries are engaging in zero emission. Uh, and uh, to reach zero emission, there is a need to reduce direct transport emissions. Uh, so everything that is linked to deliveries uh, and to corporate fleets, that's part of scope one emissions that many businesses are already tackling. Uh, there are many countries and cities that are changing their regulations, uh, both for employee mobility and also for deliveries. Uh, encouraging sustainability. So that's also something uh, that encourages businesses to engage. Uh, and finally, uh, there are mobility policies that are part of a firm's attractiveness. Uh, so there are many uh, employees who will be interested in working for a firm where there are uh, interesting mobility policies. Uh, and that's also a point that is uh, important for businesses. Uh, we are also facing uh, unprecedented uh, changes in mobility uh, because of the COVID crisis. And all these changes uh, 
they make us say that we need to do something now to make mobility more sustainable. Uh, so there are positive changes that we have observed. For example, the increase in active modes. There's been a huge increase in walking and biking. There's also been an increase in working for home, and that's also positive because that reduces mobility in certain aspects. There's been a decrease in flights, uh, which also increases uh, overall mobility sustainability. But there has also been uh, some adverse effects, for example, the decrease in public transport, uh, and there are some uh, negative behaviors that have emerged uh, due to working from home. For example, uh, with parents who used to bring their children to, home, uh, to, work, to their school while going to work, now uh, having to go to bring their children to school and then go back home to work and then back to school to, uh, to bring their children home. Uh, so there's still room for improvement uh, beyond what has already happened. And we also have to avoid going back uh, to normal because there is a real opportunity that's opened up uh, due to all the changes that have occurred so far. Uh, and so we should really try to build back better and use the momentum that we have due to the pandemic in the mobility changes uh, to make sure that we don't go back to unsustainable mobility. Uh, so uh, inside WBCSD, we have started uh, working with our members uh, on uh, harnessing mobility innovation uh, for sustainability through three different projects. And I'll go a little bit more into detail on the different projects uh, that we're working on. Uh, the first one is around decarbonization. Uh, the second one is on digitalization and data sharing. Uh, the third one is on commuting behavior change. Uh, so the goal in the decarbonization uh, project is to make sure that we can help uh, make the corporate fleets uh, electric and through that uh, reach the decarbonization levels that exist in some in, uh, objectives that exist in some cities. Uh, to do so, it's not enough uh, to just convince businesses that they need to electrify uh, there's also a great aspect uh, that is linked to infrastructure that needs to be worked on. Uh, and there are beyond the, the questions uh, around the infrastructure and the fleet electrification, uh, also uh, a lot of uh, aspects on policies that have to be worked on. Uh, and so the, the project that we are working on uh, helps companies in the electrification process. Uh, it also tries to work on uh, how we can create business model uh, that make the charging infrastructure uh, sustainable and uh, economically viable, uh, because that's also uh, one aspect that is often overlooked in sustainability is that uh, we cannot have solutions that are uh, just good for the planet. We also have to have economically viable solutions. Uh, and uh, beyond that, uh, we try to uh, accompany cities in putting these systems in place. Uh, then we have the project on data. So uh, our project on data and digitalization uh, is above all a coalition uh, that has been working on seeing how uh, we can build data sharing policies uh, that make sure that uh, once we have uh, all the data that, that we need, uh, we can actually uh, exploit it in a way uh, that is uh, regulated and uh, use it in several different use cases. For example, for mobility as a service, uh, for EV charging infrastructure, in connected infrastructure, and in smart logistics. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and we have just launched a report on sustainable mobility policy making for data sharing uh, that outlines the work that we have done so far um, and uh, puts a stone in the ground, let's just say it like that, uh, to make sure that um, data sharing is done uh, in a way that allows us to use it for sustainable mobility purposes. Uh, the last project we have is on commuting behavior change. Uh, so this project uh, focus on uh, making sure that uh, the companies don't only look at the direct emissions that they can easily uh, control, for example, the emissions from their fleets or the emissions from uh, freight transport, 
but that they also look at uh, emissions that their employees have, uh, because we firmly believe that um, uh, changing employees' behavior uh, is key also to make uh, transport more sustainable. Uh, it's also interesting for businesses because uh, it allows them to reduce their uh, CO2 emissions from a scope tree. Uh, it also allows them to reduce costs in many cases and to improve attractiveness and employee well-being. Uh, so to accompany uh, companies in this step, uh, we are working both on uh, measuring the impact uh, that uh, employee uh, mobility has uh, on creating a framework uh, on behavior change and uh, on corporate mobility policies uh, and identifying use cases and practice, best practices that exist uh, throughout the world. And in parallel to that, uh, we are trying to build corporate mobility pacts, which are pacts with cities. And I'll go into more detail on that uh, right away. Uh, so the corporate mobility pacts, uh, they are our way to work with cities because we cannot work on transport and mobility uh, without taking into account the cities in which this transport and this mobility takes place. That's because uh, mobility is very context dependent. Uh, so it's very different to try to make mobility sustainable in Paris where a lot of uh, public transport options exist. And for example, uh, in Sao Paulo where public transport structure exists, but has a very different um, out uh, way of working than uh, in Paris. And when there are uh, as many uh, kilometers of congestion than uh, as there exist in Sao Paulo. Uh, so the corporate mobility pacts, they are an initiative uh, that tries to bring together the corporate leadership and the local, um, the local public sector. Uh, it is a tool that we can use to shift employee behavior in which uh, the companies and the public sector together uh, sign a pact uh, on the different actions that they believe might be relevant uh, for the city in itself to make mobility more sustainable. Uh, and it's actually a platform that establishes uh, some sort of dialogue uh, between uh, the public sector and the private sector. Uh, so just to make that a little bit uh, easier to understand, I'll go into uh, one of the examples that we have. Uh, so we've worked in Lisbon on a corporate mobility pact. Uh, we started in 2019 to work on this pact. Uh, there was a first uh, video that was launched uh, proposing the pact. Uh, then there were uh, several different meetings that took place uh, to make sure that we could uh, get enough businesses to adhere to this, uh, to this pact. Uh, we had a signing ceremony uh, in December, 2019, and uh, in beginning of 2020, the pact was officially launched. Uh, so this pact, uh, when it was launched, had 84 signatories uh, who signed up for 444 actions. And that actually concerned more than 100,000 people because all the employees of these companies were, con were concerned by this pact. So what's really interesting uh, in this corporate mobility pact is that we were able together with the city of Lisbon and the BCSD, which is uh, the local uh, organization working on sustainability, uh, to make sure that uh, all the actions that were put in place were actions that were considered interested, interesting by the city. Uh, so we put up a list of um, 26 different actions uh, that the city considered to be uh, steps the companies could take to make sure that mobility became more sustainable. And uh, the different cities then chose between two and uh, 15 actions that they wanted to put in place uh, in their case and signed in on they were going to do this action. So as you see, it's a really uh, low investment, both for the government and for the, for the signatories, because they're just, uh, the government only has to put in place the, the list of actions and then ask the businesses to sign in for it. And the businesses only have to choose one action and uh, they then can get a lot of positive uh, feedback, both from their employees and uh, 
uh, also a positive image that comes out of it, uh, thanks to the fact that they've signed this, uh, this pact. Uh, and uh, just to give you a little example of what kind of actions these were, uh, these actions, they ranged from uh, putting in place uh, bike and bike parking and two wheel parks uh, to reducing uh, the number of uh, automotive parking slots uh, and going through creating um, digital meeting rooms uh, and uh, also, uh, for example, replacing part of their fleets uh, through electrical vehicles. Uh, so these, these actions, they were identified as being relevant by the city uh, and uh, they actually were seen by the companies as things that were easy to put in place. Uh, so we've had the first results in this year. So there are many measures that have been put in place. So the city was really uh, very glad of the, of the outcome they have had so far because they had a a 47% increase uh, in electrical vehicles in the different corporate fleets. Uh, so of the, of the signatories, uh, not all had signed in for uh, making sure that they could uh, increase their fleet, but they, uh, the government has more than achieved its goal uh, in increase in electric vehicles that they had. Uh, we also had a 51% increase in corporate chargers. Uh, which were investments the companies made to make sure that their employees could also use the, the electric vehicles. Uh, we also had a 50% increase in bike parking space uh, and 34% increase in motorcycle parking space. Uh, and the pact has now also increased. So we now have 119 signatories and 576 different actions. Uh, there were also, of course, some changes that had to occur uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, so we had an enormous increase in employees working from home. Uh, and uh, work from home was not an action that had been flagged by the city of Lisbon as being uh, something relevant for making their mobility more sustainable in their city. But it's definitely something that uh, has had a huge impact uh, mostly due to the pandemic, uh, then uh, due to the will of the cities to um, make mobility more sustainable. Uh, but that's definitely something we're monitoring too. Uh, we also had a huge increase in creating remote meeting rooms. Uh, there was uh, also some change that was uh, not predicted. So there were a lot of companies who had signed in to decrease the internal combustion engine automobile parking slots and who were unable to do so uh, because the pandemic has, meant, has led many of their employees to uh, use cars instead of public transport to, tra uh, to do their transport. Uh, and we also had an increase in electrical vehicle parking slots, uh, which was part of the plans, but uh, which should have been accompanied by the decrease in normal parking slots, uh, which was not the case. Uh, and finally, there were some actions who could not be put in place uh, also because of the pan pandemic. Uh, for example, there were a lot of companies who uh, were trying, had a will to subsidize public transport and uh, who were not able to do so uh, because their employees were not at ease of, uh, using public transport. Uh, and that's uh, one of the aspects that really still needs working on. Uh, which is how can we make sure that uh, even when there are uh, huge and system changing uh, events, like for example, the pandemic, mobility continues to be sustainable. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that uh, a lot of public transport companies are working on uh, right now. So is to make sure that uh, public transport continues to be accessible uh, and uh, pandemic friendly, <laughs> despite everything that has been ha happening. Uh, so that's definitely one aspect that needs to be worked on also. Uh, so I would like to conclude uh, my presentation uh, with uh, a call to action uh, and some further elements on how businesses can engage and why they should. Uh, so to start, uh, I would like to say that uh, today uh, we have existing transport systems uh, in many cities that are not completely sustainable. 
And there's definitely room for improvement in these systems, uh, both through uh, developing new technologies. So there was a lot already said in other sections uh, about the different technologies that are being developed. Uh, and it's key that we can integrate them and that they can be used to make mobility more sustainable uh, because it's not necessarily the case for all technologies. Uh, there are ongoing studies now who show that uh, uh, some of the micromobility uh, trends that are, we have been seeing uh, are not as sustainable as we imagined them to be in the beginning. Uh, so there's definitely room for improvement in this aspect. Uh, beyond integrating the new technologies, uh, there's a real need to integrate the already existing technologies. Uh, so we have to be really aware of the fact that uh, there are public transport systems that are in place. Uh, some of them uh, are not sustainable unless uh, we have a high demand for them. So uh, if you take buses, for example, they have to be full to make sure that um, they are more sustainable than private cars. Uh, so that's definitely one point we need to work on also, is to make sure that uh, we exploit the existing systems also, uh, having in mind uh, that they are sustainable uh, in some cases, and in other cases they are not. So in the case they are not, they need to be replaced. Uh, but in some cases, they are more sustainable than some options that we might have. Uh, and finally, uh, there's the need to, to collaborate and to create coalitions. And we need to work together. Uh, it's not only businesses who will make the, the difference, uh, because the business can act on part of the demand and they can act on part of the uh, offer that exists. Uh, but there is a need to work uh, with governments, uh, with individuals, and with society uh, as a larger um, uh, as a larger actor. So uh, we all have a responsibility in making transport and mobility more sustainable. Uh, let's work together on it, uh, and let's act together to make it happen. So those were, uh, those, that was my presentation. Uh, I think can open up for questions now. If, uh... oh, thank you very much, Milena. Great presentation. And uh, it's really highlighting the interest to, to have an approach uh, connecting businesses and cities, which I've found on the, on the example of Lisbon really clear and uh, very interesting. So uh, I will take a look to the questions in the chat. I can see one. Yeah, I see there's already a question in the yeah, chat. Yeah, so uh, there's a question from Sylvie and I will ask uh, uh, one question later. So okay. uh, thank you for the clear presentation. My question, how do you imagine to avoid going back to normal as you mentioned? Uh, as you mentioned, it is an issue in your introduction. How do you imagine that? <laughs> yeah, so there are several steps uh, that we need to take to avoid the going back to normal. Uh, the first one is something that many of the businesses uh, I'm working with uh, have already started doing, uh, which is uh, in many sectors we have identified that uh, the mobility as we used to have it uh, and working as we used to do it does not make sense. So uh, after having worked from home during a whole year, I have several colleagues who tell me, yeah, there's no sense in me in being in the office every day. Uh, but if there's no sense in the people being in the office every day for some people, uh, for other people, we've already identified that uh, there's a need to be at their working station every day and they need more sustainable ways to get there. So there are different uh, aspects that we need to work on. The first one is for those who do not need to go to work every day, uh, make sure that we can give them enough flexibility. So the days that they have to go to work, and especially if they take uh, decisions on moving further from work uh, because they can have a better uh, quality of life in different spaces, uh, that they do not depend on the car because of that. So that's one first aspect. And the second aspect we're working on is uh, how can we make sure that essential workers who do not necessarily have a huge um, budget for their mobility, 
uh, can go to work in a sustainable way, even when uh, public transport is not necessarily uh, functioning in its uh, best way. Uh, so we have a project uh, also on the question of uh, transport equity and on making micromobility uh, through bikes and uh, electric scooters available for these employees, because these are still more sustainable solutions than giving them each a car. So that's one other way to work on. I hope that answers the question. Okay, oh, thank you, Milena. I would just like to, to bounce personally on, on your uh, uh, sure. explanation here, uh, just before taking a, another question. Uh, we've talked a lot about workers, but I would like to point out to this report of Forum de Vie Mobile, which came out uh, recently, stating that uh, they, they were focusing on the people who are not working, which is a significant proportion of the population with very specific uh, expectations. And, and on the other hand, there are people who are involved uh, in, the, in the essence who are moving for their work like deliveries. So we, we talked about that, but about people who are not working. I mean, seniors, uh, aging people or very young people, then what about them? Because how do we take that into account? Yes, and perhaps just to add to Flor's comment, because it's the same kind of uh, compliment. And thank you for the first part of the answer, which is an answer, but perhaps not looking at all social groups. Uh, uh, what do you think about not only workers or not workers, but also um, leisure, leisures? Do you really think that people yeah. who used to travel around the world will want to start again traveling when they will have the opportunity to? It's just a, an issue also about things which are not perhaps daily habits, but are very anchored in ways of life. Yeah, I think that there are two aspects uh, in which I can answer still. Uh, the first one uh, linked to what Flor uh, asked uh, is that um, also during the pandemic, there was a lot of um, putting in place uh, temporary structures for biking, for walking. Uh, and what we are trying to push for is that these temporary structures actually become part of the urban planning globally because it is vital to recover space for parking and for walking, uh, not only for the workers, but uh, to make cities more livable in a global way. Uh, and that's part of the work that's, been, that's being done uh, is trying to bring the cities to uh, rethink a little bit uh, the structure thanks to what they have already done during the COVID time. Uh, and on another aspect, uh, I don't necessarily work on the aspects of uh, more tu tourism and travel, but uh, since I've been working on behavior change, one of the things we have identified uh, is that uh, every time you have a, a big uh, disrupture, so you have a change in the way that people work and in the way that people travel or in the uh, places they live, you have the opportunity to create new habits. Uh, so what we are trying to uh, make for this part of the, the tourist, um, like on, on the tourist travel uh, is to make sure that people see the impact that they tra their travel has uh, and to try to nudge them to more sustainable uh, ways of traveling. So away from the planes uh, towards other solutions and towards um, going to more, uh, but to closer places uh, and avoiding to take the plane to another, another continent um, by making them aware of the impact this has on the planet. Okay, thank you, Milena. So uh, next comment from Guy Fournier, uh, very nice presentation. You have raised three approaches to have more sustainable cities fleet decarbonization, project on data, 
commuting behavior change, which approach is the most efficient or promising according to you? I think that's that's a really hard question because <laughs> the reason why we're wo working on the three uh, is because we believe they're complementary. I don't think that uh, one of them can uh, solve the whole problem and they are actually interlinked and there are also other aspects that are still linked with what we are working on, uh, on which if we had the resources to, we would also work um, because you can, um, actually it's important uh, to have everything that is linked to the data and digital digitalization to make sure that uh, once you put in place your electric fleets and the charging system, everything works. So you can't do uh, the electric uh, decarbonization like without the data part. Uh, you can't change behavior if you don't have data also on how behavior is today. Uh, and on the other hand, one of the ways of changing behavior is going from uh, internal comb combustion engines to electric vehicles. So it's all linked and I can't say there's one more efficient or promising. It's really a systems approach and working on different aspects of the system. Yeah, it's one of, of the key issues is that it's, it's, a, it's a system and with a, a lot of complexity yeah. interlinks. Uh, a question from Jean-Pierre, I don't know if you want to ask it directly, but I can read it. What exper expertise does Maybe, maybe I can. I can oh yes, comment. you can uh, comment. Uh, yeah, okay. of course. Yes. <laughs> well, um, uh, I had some uh, some experience with a uh, W uh, BCSD in uh, in industry, particularly in cement, uh, and uh, it, to, to to me that appeared like a lobbying group uh, mostly uh, for the, for the industry. Uh, now I understand that uh, for mobility, uh, the question of uh, of lobbying is not so is not the key issue, but then you know, I, I wonder what is uh, what what kind of uh, support do you provide to cities like Lisbon uh, in 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 suggesting a, a corporate mobility pack? Do you do you provide uh, uh, some form of expertise, uh, some uh, uh, some subsidies uh, uh, that you would? Uh, provide? Uh, uh, do, you, do you try to make transfer from uh, one uh, cities to another? Uh, so I, uh, I, I also uh, had some interaction with uh, C40. C40 yeah. is, is, uh, is also trying to have an action, you see, on mobility in large cities. Uh, could you could you contrast complement you know say, say in which way you, you complement or you, you, you defer from action in C40? Yeah, sure. Uh, so just to, to react on your first comment, uh, yeah, WBCSD has an aspect that is linked to lobbying and to uh, working with governments to change policies. Uh, so that's definitely one aspect we work on, but it's not the main aspect in the mobility group. Uh, so you probably uh, were in contact with a project from the cement industry. Uh, so that was an industry-specific project. Uh, and um, we work with several different um, cities organizations. So we work with C40, we also work with Polis, uh, and we also work with INTA, which you might know, uh, who are cities organizations. And uh, we do not wish to compete with them, we're complementary. Uh, so what we do is that uh, when they have demands of cities who wish to uh, work on uh, partnerships with businesses, uh, then we interact with them. Because uh, we have, uh, around the corporate mobility pacts, created uh, a series of tools uh, that can help the cities put in place their corporate mobility pact. Uh, and since we have our 200 members, uh, bus business members uh, who have signed in, we can easily find businesses that locally are interested in working uh, on a corporate mobility pact. And once we have, uh, let's say, a core of businesses uh, between five and six who are really interested and who have signed up, it's easier to uh, create a movement and to get mass. And finally, uh, having the WBCSD um, as a partner helps them uh, to uh, get more businesses in and to make sure that they have uh, impact on a local level. Uh, 
so we we do not provide subsidies. Uh, uh, we don't ask them for money either. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a win-win actually for us if we can get our businesses uh, into uh, action that makes mobility more sustainable. Then we are fulfilling our mission, uh, and uh, businesses are often interested in. Uh, working with cities in these kinds of um, of pacts because it actually opens uh, a dialogue uh, between the public and the private sector, uh, which is often hard to put in place. So that's actually where we contribute most in creating this dialogue. Thank you. Uh, I think, Tiat, you're raising your hand. Yes, I do. I have a question which I cannot put in, in a quick sentence. Because <laughs> I was um, I was very intrigued by the the point on well different kind of policies which can change the behavior of employees from big companies and it reminded me on what the Netherlands is doing for example where the government has a, a tax reduction scheme more or less which if the company wants to and enables it um, encourages people to take the bike more and so on so I was wondering what the stance from the WBCSD is on these kind of incentive mechanisms from governments and how maybe a role can be to enable them further or to to build this relationship to not have all the responsibility on the businesses neither on the government but to really have a, a complementary approach yeah so uh when i spoke about policies there are two aspects that uh, actually come in uh, into mind so there's on one side the public policies as you are saying and then there are the corporate mobility policies which are the policies put in place by uh, different um, different businesses. Uh, so there's definitely a need to align them better. Uh, and uh, that's not something I'm, uh, I'm already working on, but uh, it's the continuity of the project that, and which we will work on next year uh, is to identify the public policies that are in place uh, throughout the world and to see which are the best practices that exist. Because uh, the Netherlands has some really interesting public policies, France also, France has very interesting public policies with Le uh, Forfait Mobilité Durable, which has been put in place uh, not so long ago and where we are just getting the first results out now. Uh, and it would be interesting, uh, especially uh, from the point of view of uh, an organization that is global, uh, to have an overview of how this impacts uh, mobility throughout the world and also to learn from the best practices and make sure that uh, they can be put in place. And it's really tricky because um, mobility policies can be uh, specific policies that, for example, uh, allow businesses to have uh, a budget or an incentive uh, for their employees that's not taxed. But they can also be policies that are taken for completely different reasons. Uh, for example, uh, the number of parking slots you have to build uh, when you build a building. And so we have to have an overview of all of that and make sure that uh, we look into policies that are also linked to urbanism and policies that are linked to health uh, uh, to have uh, a view of everything that is being done. Uh, so that's definitely something that uh, we are interested in, in uh, and where there is still work to be done. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Milena. I, oh, yeah, Guy, for a last quick one, and then we'll move to uh, Jean-Pierre's presentation. Yeah, Guy, do you want to yes, uh, have a hello. word? Um, so it was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. I have a question belonging to the policy. Um, so in fact, we have um, um, two changes we, we, we can see. Uh, if we'd like to have more um, sustainable cities, this means that the weight of, um, of uh, stakeholders like um, OEMs, so uh, big um, uh, motor companies, uh, will be reduced because it is against individual mobility. This is one point. On the other side, if you're introducing more digi digital or data sharing, what you were rising as well, uh, we will have, we can have a more influence of a new big um, GAFA companies which can manage and capture the EU. So how are you managing this in terms of policy? Uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's only part of the vision that you can have of uh, how the actors might move. 
and it will, it will be really hard to have a, a short answer for that. Uh, but uh, we are not, uh, we're not us putting in place the policy. We are giving some advice on uh, how policy could be in place uh, to make sure that uh, data sharing is done uh, in a um, um, smooth way and that there is no uh, shifts in, in power or no one who is, uh, like, who is disadvantaged by that. Uh, but I, I don't have a, a clear answer on how can we make sure that uh, you don't completely change the balance of power. Also because we are not the ones doing the policies, that's the governments who put in place the policies. We can only make recommendations. Okay. I think it's, it's time to move on. I can, yeah. Uh, I think we, we, we're going to, to move on because we could discuss